Good afternoon. It's uh, great to be here. Um, some of you may be aware that I'm an alumni of Tyndale, and um, I graduated here from here, well, from over there, uh, quite a few years ago, about 28, I think. And um, it's just a, a privilege to come back. I'm quite honored. Thank you so much. Um, the topic I'm going to be speaking about today in the theme of loving your enemies is relating to that of refugees. Um, as I'm sure if any of you turn on the news um, reports today, the topic of refugees is pretty high um, on the radar of most people's um, lives, or, or at least it's in the news. And um, uh, before I begin speaking about it and, and sort of looking at it, the big picture, I just want to clarify a few little things about my talk this, this afternoon. And um, that is, I, the whole issue of root causes of refugees is a whole topic that I certainly couldn't touch today. But really, if you really, really get down to it, I think fear and hate is a root cause. Um, it's just maybe the simple, simple way of putting it. It's, uh, and if you look at the world today, most uh, countries or places where refugees are coming from, it's not usually one country fighting against another. Sadly, it's civil wars. It's countries divided against themselves and ethnic factions fighting against themselves. And years ago, through my work with refugees, I ended up, I visited uh, northern Iraq, the Kurdish area, and um, I saw just the horrible destruction that Saddam Hussein and his forces uh, made in Iraq. And, and having, in, in later years, I've read a bit more about the, just Saddam Hussein himself. And if you look at his childhood, he was, uh, his father died when he was just around the time he was born. And he was, had a stepfather who was extremely abusive. And he was just a very unloved, hurt person. I just use him as an example, but I, I fear, it just, I really appreciated what Sister um, Sue shared this morning. Um, it's that, that part in our heart, if we haven't filled it with love and, and um, compassion and, and have it been filled in that way, other things can get in and it can become so painful. Um, um, the other thing I just like to. Uh, bring forward in the context of this talk is while we might be looking at ourselves as Canadians thinking, well, who should we let in? Should we let in refugees? What should we do about refugees? I do want to challenge the notion of even our sense of nationhood and borders and this sense of this is our land and um, and, you know, there's there certainly the colonialists, we could argue our First Nations people could say it's their land. But I would even argue, if you really look through scripture, there are a number of passages where, where God just talks about, you know, it's his land. And in Leviticus 25, verse uh, 23, when God is actually speaking to the Israelites about the year of Jubilee um, and giving the land back to them, he reminds them, he says, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you are but aliens and my tenants. So it's kind of the question of who, 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 who of us can say this is mine and I was here first. Um, so giving that context, um, speaking about the world of refugees today, in, our, in the history of the world, the, there are the largest number of refugees and internally displaced people today. There are close to 60 million of them um, around the world, the largest number of late being Syrians. Um, but, I, and while I have great compassion about the Syrians, I do just want to point out, because it, some, it almost seems forgotten, that there are huge other people groups. There are Eritreans, for example, refugees who used to be part of Ethiopia, and there's more than 2.5 million of those that are displaced as refugees now. And Eritrea has been called the North Korea of Africa, but many people don't know about it because there aren't bombs being dropped on it. There are other places where in the world where refugees have been living in camps for 20 and 30 years. Generations are being born and there's no solution for them. Um, and so I say that because in some ways, 
since I think it was in September when that photo of that little boy, Alan Kurdi, on the beach in Turkey appeared and really moved the hearts of many, it was almost as if people suddenly realized, oh, there's refugees in the world. And I know people have come up to me asking, oh, well, gee, now are, are you really busy? You know, because suddenly there's a lot of refugees in the world. And I kind of feel like saying, well, actually, there are about 60 million even before last September. But um, at the same time, I, as a person who has been working with refugees for many years, I have been thrilled that the eyes of people, and Canadians in particular, are being open to the plight of refugees. And there is this outpouring of, of love and compassion in many places within our society. And, and it, it really, really warms my heart. But at the same time, as I'm looking at both the reaction in Canada and around the world, I feel like people are quite fickle. You know, in, in the early part of the fall, everyone was full of compassion. Let's love refugees. Let's welcome them. Then the Paris attack happened. And suddenly, there was all kinds of outcries. Let's stop. Let's not bring our refugees in. Let's, let's change our mind. Let's, let's close the doors. And so suddenly there was this, no, we don't like refugees. Then once the first Syrians started to arrive and Justin Trudeau went and welcomed them, and which I really appreciate, by the way. I thought it was a great example. Um, you know, welcome them. And we heard some warm stories. Then there was more of a love for them. But then Cologne, Germany happened. And there are those sexual assaults. And suddenly, oh, now all refugees were, you know, painted poorly again. And so there was calls to close our doors. And it seems like every day, you just don't know what you're going to read in the news. A refugee has done something either right or wrong, and there's all kinds of strong feelings about how they should be treated. I, I feel that's all rather um, re reactionary. And I guess as a Christian, I, I, I understand there's often people have these fears, and it's a fear of the unknown, and so they don't know how to respond. But I would ask, as a Christian, what, how would Jesus respond to refugees? What does the Bible um, call us to do? And so I'd just like to take a few minutes to um, reflect on that. And um, there are many passages, both in the Old Testament and in the New, that speak about the aliens or strangers, which I feel refugees would fit into that category. And it's it's, the Bible is quite clear on how we should respond to them. First of all, in the Old Te Testament, just talking about legally how we would, should respond to them, um, there are passages, there are a number of them. I'm just going to name a few. In Numbers chapter 15, verses 15 and 16, um, it says, The community is to have the same laws for you and for the alien living among you. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You and the alien should be the same before the law. The same laws and regulations will apply both to you and to the alien living among you. Which is interesting. We, you know, there was a debates about should they have, should refugees have health care and all those sort of things. Well, the Bible clearly says they should have the same laws, the same rights. Socially, how should we treat them? Leviticus 19, um, verses 33 to 34, among others, says, When an alien lives among you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living among you, among you must be treated as your native born. And then this is a more powerful statement. Do you know what else it says in that passage? The next line says, Love him as yourself. For you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And another passage, Deuteronomy 10:19, also says, And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. So it's quite emphatic. Even the Old Testament, the aliens that come among us are to be loved. They're to be treated the same. They're to have the same laws. They're not to be mistreated. And yeah, to be loved is, is quite powerful. And this, this concept or the, the notion of loving the alien, I think is beautifully portrayed in Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan in the New Testament. 
And as you know, there are many passages in the New Testament also speaking about loving the stranger. But the, I, I just want to look at the parable of the Good Samaritan um, in a bit of detail today because I just think it's a beautiful example of radical hospitality, which we as Christians are called to give. Um, as you know, I'm not going to read that passage, but I trust most of you know the, the story of the Good Samaritan where there's this expert in the law that comes up to Jesus and asks, you know, what he must do to inherit eternal life, and he quotes how he must love God and, and, and then to love his neighbor as himself. And Jesus says, you know, you're right. But then the expert says, well, and who is my neighbor? And so then Jesus tells a parable of the uh, Good Samaritan, and it's really quite um, interesting how uh, in, that, in that story, there was a priest and the Levite that passed by on the other side of the road um, and didn't even come near the victim. But when the Samaritan came along and looked at him, uh, I, I mean, I, I think of today, <laughs> here he was, this victim on the, on the road. And in fact, some commentaries even say that maybe, that, that apparently the road to Jericho was a very dangerous road, and so there were robbers and thieves. So maybe the priests and the Levite were worrying that they would be attacked or whatever if they, they helped him. But, um, or maybe this person was a, you know, a bad person of some sort. But the, the Samaritan came along looked at him. He didn't do a security check on him. <laughs> he didn't do any kind of pre-screening. He just looked at him, saw his need, reached down, picked him up, bandaged his womb, put him on his donkey, and brought him to the inn and, and cared for him. And I feel it's a beautiful, beautiful example of, of radical hospitality. As, as I was preparing for this talk, I, I happened to read a quote of Martin Luther King speaking on this passage. And interestingly, um, Martin Luther King said that the first question that the priest and the Levite who passed by may have asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Looking at risk, you know, if I help this person, what will happen to me? Or whatever risk meant for them. But the Good Samaritan, when he saw him, um, what he potentially asked himself is, if I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? Which I think is a very powerful difference. He was concerned about this man. He overcame risk, and he just reached down, and he, he cared for him. He brought him to the inn. It says he spent the night with him. Here, was, here he was with this perfect stranger, and who knows? I just really want to point out, we have no idea what kind of a person that victim was. That, that could have been, we, I, I used to always assume that it was a really nice, you know, needy person, <laughs> but maybe the person was not. But he just loved him and cared for him, bandaged his room. And in fact, the next day when he left, um, he went to the innkeeper and gave him money, paying for his stay, and then he even gave him more and said, if this man incurs an even higher uh, debt, I will pay it on my way back, which is an incredible risk when you think of it. And I think of today, you know, I, I hear people talk about, oh, refugees, oh, they've just, they come here, they're just going to take advantage of our system and blah, blah, blah. Well, I look at, at this um, Samaritan and he just said, hey, if he incurs a higher debt, I'll pay that too. Like, he, he radical hospitality. Lavished, he just lavished his love and his grace on him. And um, I, I just, I really do feel that, that I mean, Jesus, Jesus is the one that told this story. I, I really feel it's a message that we need to take to heart. That it's not just, well, if we like them, if they fit, you know, the mold that we want, if they're the right religion or the right size or shape or whatever. We're just called to, to love them and those especially in need, which I believe a refugee would be a, a prime example of that. Um, yet I know people have fears, you know, and oh, well, what if, what if this? What if they're terrorists? What if they're whatever? But I, I feel that we need to really take um, Jesus' commands at, to heart, that, that we really are to um, reach out. And just recently I heard um, 
Brian Stiller, who some of you may know us <laughs> um, from here, uh, was interviewed on a program about his recent visit. He traveled through Europe and he visited all kinds of refugee hotspots. And when he was asked, well, how should he respond? How should Canadians respond um, to the whole refugee crisis and refugees coming our way? And his response was, which I really appreciate, I'm going to quote many times, he said, I'd rather risk with love than protect with fear. And I just think that is so true. And, and Jesus said to, to the rich, uh, the, the expert in the law at the end of that parable, um, he said, you know, who was the one that was a true neighbor? And he said, the one that, that helped him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. And on that line, so I, um, I wanted to share a little bit about Matthew House and, and what do we do. And I, my hope is that we do carry out that, that call to um, welcome the stranger in Jesus' name. Our name, Matthew House, comes from the passage in Matthew 25, 35, where Jesus said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was hungry and you fed me, etc. And Matthew House uh, is a shelter for newly arrived refugee claimants in Toronto. And claimants, just to clarify, there are three ways refugees come to Canada. Some come through government sponsorships, where the government brings them in, which are some of the Syrians. Others come through private sponsorships, where private groups like churches will sponsor them and bring them. But there's a third group known as refugee claimants, or asylum seekers, who just arrive on our doorstep. For whatever reason, they couldn't get to a visa post to get a visa, and they ask for asylum on arrival in Canada. And those, this group of refugee claimants, have no one to welcome or, or assist them. And that was my big aha moment 28 years ago, just after I graduated from Tyndale. I ended up, by God's providence, working at a homeless shelter that received refugee claimants. And I realized that there were thousands and thousands of refugee claimants arriving on our doorstep and they had no one to welcome them. They were literally numbered among the homeless. And, and they were desperate. And some of them were forced to go to the really, really rough homeless shelters where some of them were, are re-traumatized upon arrival. And it's not exactly the warmest welcome to Canada. And it broke my heart. And, and that's actually what gave me the vision of opening Matthew House. Because I longed to create a place where what, what refugees could be welcomed into a, a caring Christian environment. Um, and just to, just to let you know, the, the, the people that arrive on our doorstep, the refugee claimants, many of them have not even asked for asylum yet because sometimes they're literally dumped on the street by smugglers. They're brought to Canada and they're just dumped there. In fact, just in the last few months, we've had five teenagers um, arrive at our home three girls from Eritrea and two young boys from Afghanistan, 16 and 17 years old. All of them are, came by themselves with no parents, and they literally came with the clothes on their back. The three girls were literally at different times, each came individually, were dumped on the street and just ma finally made their way to us. Um, and we, we try and provide that welcoming um, place. Since we opened in 1998, we've welcomed over 1,400 refugees from 94 different nations. They've come from all walks of life. We've had doctors, lawyers, engineers. We've had priests, Anglican priests, and we've had imams. Um, and we've had people who are illiterate in their own language. But the one thing they share in common is a fear of persecution and a need for a safe place. We, since opening, we, aside from the other refugee houses around um, Canada, we've also been able to open two more transition homes in the city where extra vulnerable refugees like the teenagers can live for longer amounts of time and be supported. And, um, but, 
And, and sometimes people ask me, well, what's it like, you know, running a place like Matthew House with all these people? Sometimes are they from warring factions and, you know, are there fights in the house or anything like that? And, and I, I have, sorry, I shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> Maybe you might be thinking that, but it's incredible um, what a uh, loving home Matthew House is. And, and certainly that was my prayer from the beginning. Um, I long to create a home where people could be welcomed in Jesus' name, where they could feel in a tangible way that, that love of Christ. Um, I, in fact, I once took our staff to see the movie Les Miserables when it was playing a few years ago because I love, I, I just love that whole story and the way how at the beginning it was because of the love that he experienced from that priest where he stayed briefly he was moved to to um, live um, in grace eventually. And my heart's desire is that Matthew House be a place where God's love is felt in intangible ways. And I believe it is being felt that way. Many, many refugees. I could tell so many stories um, here about how they've been touched by, by God's love in our home. Um, one of the things, about six years ago, we had a makeover of Matthew House by our living room, dining room, by that TV program, Divine Design. Maybe some of you know it. And they redid our living room and dining room. It was a gift. And in our dining room, they gave, gave us, it was all a gift, this beautiful $5,000 crystal chandelier. And I remember I was told that if we wanted to sell it afterwards, you know, we could and just get a less expensive one and not have it. But I must say... It's around, there's this big, beautiful round table. I must say, I've never had the heart to um, sell it because it makes me just feel so good to welcome refugees. Many of them have been on the refugee highway traveling for weeks or months or even years, and they've been oppressed and suppressed and depressed as they travel. And so when they come in our door, to be able to welcome them in Jesus' name and then say, come, join us for dinner, and to bring them to this beautiful table with this beautiful chandelier. I, you know, I, my heart's desire is that they all just feel so beloved, <laughs> so precious and loved in, in God's sight. And, and that is what our desire for our home to be is to be that place where God's love is um, felt, and and you know in in our 18 years of existence, and 1,400 people from 94 different nations, we have had nothing stolen from our home. And a year, a, last year we had a UN delegation come. They were doing a study on alternatives to detention, and um, they they asked us all kinds of questions about, you know, our place. And there was even someone from um, the, the there were, it was an international delegation. There was someone from the U.S. Homeland Security, a rep was there, and, and, and other government officials from all around the world. And I think that there, so many people have this impression that refugees are bad people that are somehow, you know, out to do something. And for us to be able to say, you know, we've had nothing stolen. This is, it's, I believe it's because people feel that they're valued in our homes. Um, and I just want to share one little story of uh, just a what's life like at Matthew House. And just to give you that sense of that, that community we have, once a week we have um, uh, house meetings and we sit around the dining room table and we just uh, share, get to know each other a bit more, and then just talk about life at the house and who needs to do which chores and things like that. And one particular evening a few years ago, I happened to be leading it, and I asked the people sitting around the table, if, if in 10 years' time, if we were to come back to this table, uh, what would be your hope or your dream? And we went around the circle, and, you know, one a Nigerian man said, oh, he hoped to, you know, start his own business. And there, was, there were two Iranian men, and each of them were um, engineers. And one was actually an Iranian who was a Christian. He had become a Christian before arriving in Canada. And he talked about wanting to establish a business. And he would hire vulnerable people, he said. And then there was a woman from Colombia who, whose son at the time was 11 years old and was watching, it was when the Vancouver Olympics were on. And she said his dream was to win a medal in ice skating for Canada in future, 10 years from now. And actually, just as an aside, I want you to know that he is in Toronto 
on the Toronto speed skating team, and he is one of the fastest in Canada. So watch for him. It's pretty exciting. Um, but then there was another man from Colombia around the table who had just arrived, who had been a successful accountant, had his own company, wealthy man, who literally had to flee in a moment's notice. And when it came to him, he started to speak. He said, in 10 years, and then he just burst into tears. He said, in 10 years, I can't even think that far ahead. He said, I'm just so worried about tomorrow. And he just began to weep. And all of us felt for him. And interestingly, the Iranian fellow that I had mentioned, the, the Christian one, whose name happened to be Mohammed, turned to me and he said, Anne, can we pray for Jose? And well, how do you say no to that? And I said, well, of course. And so we all joined together, joined our hands, and Mohammed couldn't speak English very well, but another Iranian translated for him, and he prayed this beautiful prayer for him, that he would know God's love and God's peace and God's hope. And... Um, it was just one of those beautiful moments, and I could tell you of many, many other moments like that that have happened over the years at Matthew's. And there have been people from many different faiths um, that have become followers of Jesus because of the love that they experience at, at Matthew's. And, and I remember one very learned um, Afghan man who attended a seminar at a, a church um, where I was at one time, and the seminar was how to reach people of other faiths. And, and they ultimately kind of said, you know, really it comes down to love. And I remember this man saying, yes, he said, that's it, that's it. It's really, it's love, it's that which we experienced. It's that feeling of inclusion. And um, now we can change to the next slide. <laughs> I'm just about finished. Um, I just wanted to share a story, and this is not a refugee story, this is a Canadian man story. Um, this lovely old man, some of you may have met him. Uh, some of you might know a man named Larry Matthews, who has supported Tyndale over the years in different ways. Well, this is Larry's father, Gerald Matthews, his late father, who at the age of 74, um, maybe about 12 years ago, came to serve as our night manager at Matthew House and a live-in night manager to live with the residents. And he came from Fredericton, New Brunswick. I don't know if he'd seen people of other, <laughs> other uh, races or religions before. And I remember asking him when we did the little interview in our backyard, I said to him, so Jerry, I said, how do you feel about meeting people from other nations and other cultures and faiths? And, and he said, do you want my honest answer? And I said, yes. And he said, to be honest, he said, I'm terrified but I'm willing to try. And God bless him, that's what he did. And actually, to, just to clarify, his, his terrifiedness wasn't the, of the people so much as that he might do something wrong, you know, inappropriate. But um, he, he probably did a few inappropriate things. I say that in, in, in the, just in, the, in a fun way. But it was his love that over superseded everything. And he was so loved by the residents. He became truly, he became known as Papa Jerry. And they loved him. He, would, he, he treated them like they were his children. And um, so he just... He cared for them. And I, I just want to share that at his, uh, ultimately he passed away um, when he was 82 years old, just a few months after he left. And there were greetings sent to him from as far about, to us, from as far as away as Afghanistan, um, mourning his loss. And who would have guessed that a man like that um, would, would have um, made such an impact? But what Papa Jerry, uh, said to me as we philosophize sometimes in the evenings, he said, you know, Anne, he said, all these years at working at Matthew House, after working at Matthew House, he says, I've come to realize that, you know, we're really all the same at heart. He said, we have the same hearts. We're just humans. And just as, as Sister Sue shared this morning, we all have feelings, we all have hearts. And he said, and you know, when we cry, our tears are all the same color. And for him, that was, that was his profound insight. And I guess that is the challenge that I just 
would like to share with all of us that are we willing to be like Papa Jerry? And maybe some of us have, do have fears, fears of the unknown, fears of others. Um, but are we willing to overcome our fears and, and risk with love instead of protect with fear? Thank you.